Hi there, everyone. How are you doing? My name is Sharon Combs, and I'm here with Mr. LeWayne Perkins. Hey, hey, happy Saturday. Uh, happy Saturday. This is Knowledge and Nonsense. Hey, today, this is our community edition. You know, we talk about things inside the facility, and on the weekends, often we hit things outside of the facility that still has to do with us, because although it feels like we live at work, we don't. And so today, we're going to talk about diversity in libraries. We're going to talk about what processes go into certain things, why certain things are trying to be removed, and if representation really matters. Uh, you want to be able to see yourself. Even as a child, you want to be able to see and identify with things that are important to you. Uh, the way, have you heard anything? You know, I'm down here in Texas, so it's a hot button item. But have you have you heard, is the media carrying it up where you are that people are trying to remove like books and just really arguing, saying so many things about critical race theory when they may not be. Has that hit your neck of the woods at all yet? Yeah, yes, yes. You know, and this is not this is not new. Right? Critical race theory may be um, the hottest topic, but uh, representation and literature is not a new discussion. You know, um, it, it's an ongoing fight and struggle for many um, communities. Um, usually, communities that are not in power, usually the poorest communities, and usually minority communities. You know, are simply not represented in in the in the daily lives in the textbooks, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, I am too. Yeah. I am too. Our guest is a lady. Her name is Leah Birmingham. She's out of Fort Worth, uh, Texas, which is near Dallas, but it's Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, we're gonna just be able to ask some questions and see kind of what goes into selection, what why people are deselecting, where there may be some misunderstandings. And I'm excited too because this conversation is three of us in it, and we're gonna have three viewpoints. Yeah. And so I always love it like that on knowledge or nonsense. I like that. I like that. Yeah. So uh, you guys know what to do. Please share this video. If you have any questions, you can put them in the comment box or you can text them to 214 717 5921. But uh, we're gonna take about 20 seconds. And when we come back, when we come back, when we return, we'll be joined by Leah Birmingham from Fort Worth, and we're gonna get into it. We're going to get into it, not politically correct. We're going to get into the nuts and bolts of this conversation. It's, it's a needed discussion, I believe. Mm -hmm. And we're back. Thank you so much. Happy Saturday, everybody. Uh, we're joined Happy by Saturday. Leah Birmingham out of Fort Worth. Leah, you look amazing. That sunlight is amazing. It's like, is that sunlight? <laughs> is that a ring light? It's just hitting you just right. It's, it's a ring light. And a little Man, light. it looks good. No, you you look amazing. Don't change anything. Melanin popping. I love it. Um, I'm sorry for saying melanin popping. You just look amazing. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. It is popping. Yes. It's all right. <laughs> yes, it, is. it always pops. Yes. So, hey, um, we just wanted to ask you a few questions. Uh, down here in Texas, I know we all stay in this program goes nationwide, but we've heard a lot and there's been a lot of conversation. You know, I hail from Oklahoma about critical race theory. Um, about taking books out that, you know, people are using the public education system to try to, you know, teach our babies to be gay or teach our babies that they're bad and you should be ashamed of yourselves. And so, like, have you, like, how does, how does the process go in what books? Like, why are the books under attack? That's, that's, why do you feel like books are under attack? Well, it's, um, you guys opened the show with um, the discussion of critical race theory, which is a curriculum. Um, and it was a post-secondary curriculum, um, not anything that would have would be taught in pre-K through 12th grade, but um, somehow it has become a political hot button. And it is being <laughs> used... Um, and we're schools are being dragged in it. Um, I just let's be clear: critical race theory is not being taught in pre-K through twelfth grade curriculum in any form. 
um, are some of our um, po uh, politicians have somehow twisted the idea of critical race theory into giving it a broader meaning, applying it to education as to saying it involves teaching about race and intersexual uh, sectionality, but that's that's not what critical race theory is. Critical race theory is actually a curri cu um, curriculum about the structures and systems of American history, including the justice and political system and how it applies to race. That is critical race theory. That is not taught in our school systems, okay? Um, now, when it, so to pile it on even more, they're saying that we have books that are teaching about race and um, are somehow, and this is going into this new house bill here in Texas, um, that's saying, you know, we can't teach anything that makes a child feel uncomfortable, uh, make them feel bad about who they are, um, bad about, make them feel um, ostracized or any kind of way, which that should include all students, of course, right? Uh, when you teach race, because think about how we feel when we watch Roots or when we watch 12 Years a Slave, how, you know, how does that make us feel? I just showed Ruby Bridges to a group of students and the minority students were quite upset about that. So according to the new house bill, I should have been in trouble for showing Ruby Bridges because there was no white students who felt uncomfortable. It was the minority students who felt uncomfortable. But of course, that house bill was not applying to minority students. It was applying to white students. We can't make them feel uncomfortable. So now they're, they're looking for books that could possibly apply to the sensitivities of white children. And they're being pulled out. Well, they're being requested. It's a request now, uh, a 16 page spreadsheet with 850 books that, um, there's a request to have these books pulled from the shelves. And in some school districts, these books are being pulled from the shelves. And in many cases, in a lot of states, librarians are being fired because they are not pulling these books from the shelf. Okay, so now wow. again, Luane, oh, were you about to say something, Luane? No, 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 it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just mind boggling. It like mm -hmm. brings you back to when they like burn all the books, you know, like you see these times in history where they're like, burn the books, burn the books. Yeah. And again, I don't feel like any child should be made to feel bad, but sometimes history just is history. And if you don't know your history, you are doomed to repeat it. And that's American history. You know, no, that's American. No. Wayne, you got to bring it, Lewayne. No, no. I, it, see it, it, I see it formulating. It, it, what, what, what it bring bears to mind is that um, I almost want to say, so what, you feel uncomfortable? This is this is life. This is what's going to happen from, from the time you come into this beautiful world until as you uh, excel to future academia. You know, this You're going to be posed with topics, questions that are going to make you uncomfortable. Now, I do think it should be scaled um, on a level that's appropriate for each age group, right? No one, I don't want my kindergartner I don't want my kindergarten seeing roots, right? I don't want them seeing the trail of tears at seven, eight years old. You know, I think it should be scaled to, to a, a, a level where they can in, interpret the information appropriately. You know, instead of running out the classroom saying, hey, all white people are evil or all black people are mean, or, you know, it has to be scaled appropriately. Um, and I'm glad you, you led off by saying people think that critical race theory is something new. It's not new, you know? Um, is a concept that close to or more than 40 years old is now getting highlighted um, and used, at, used by a lot of political pundits to spin a narrative. And you see this every year, uh, well, depending on the election cycle, every two years, every four years, uh, but you'll see more of this as we get closer to midterm elections. You know, people are trying to galvanize a base, galvanize a base, um, instead of speaking uh, for their constituents they're trying to galvanize the base. And I see this term um, team being exploded in, in certain churches, in certain states, uh, certain, um, and, and all of this is, is, is almost frightening because I, I, I now think it's an attack, my opinion, on the freedom of speech and expression, right? 
Um, but I'm level with that statement. You know how we have some um, some schools, they, they stop a certain organization from speaking on the campus. I agree with freedom of speech. I say let these people bring what they want to bring in front of these, these future minds and let the students and that institution carry the burden of is this what we want to represent and challenge it. So I'm 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 sort of um, level on both ends. Whether you're progressive or conservative, you should have the right for freedom of speech. Textbooks should speak a uh, true story and not just a, a perverted version of one man's or person's perception. They should speak about what happened. Uh, if we can level that playing field, I think this would this would be the cure for uh, really defining this great experiment in America. We got to stop lying to folks. And, and I'm happy you know, you spoke on freedom of speech because in libraries, we follow guidelines of intellectual freedom, which means students have the right to read what they want in the form that they want to read it. And as a librarian, I cannot interfere with that. My job is to put the material out there. Mm -hmm. I put the information there. They decide, they have the right to decide what they want to read and what they do not want to read. I do not have the right to stop a student and say, hey, you cannot read that book. Hey, that book is not appropriate for you. Hey, that book is too mature. Now, I do have the responsibility of ensuring that my collection represents the age group that I service but I can't interfere with what they choose to bring up to the uh, circulation desk and check out. That violates their intellectual freedom. Wow. And I will not do that. Um, that goes against all of my principles as a school librarian. Now- Oh, I, would, I just wanted to interject right here. This really, this again is why I believe representation matters you know, like we have Women's Month, we have Black History Month, uh, June, which is a lot of like Juneteenth and Black celebrations, but it's also like the LGBTQ month. Um, so you have these different months, right? And there's so many other months that I may not be mentioning now. And we have these months because historically there has been a lack of representation. And so representation does matter. And as a child, you know, a lot of people are like, well, that's ancient history. That's the past. You know, you can't live in the past. You can't do this. But right now, I guarantee you, there is a young African-American girl who may be the only black person in her school. And so, you know, going to the library and, and seeing like a, a Ruby Bridges or seeing books that have her on it, things that look like her, that's representation. And, you know, that's like a safe place. Books are where you learn. Books are where your imagination is allowed to flourish and grow. Books help foster critical thinking, not critical race theory, but critical thinking. And it helps you to think even outside of yourself and outside mm -hmm. of your narrative of your zip code. Because even in the workplace, how, how detrimental is it when you go in there and the only thing you can think of is your zip code? You go in there with all kind of biases when you walk in with only your zip code. And so I just I wanted to interject that because representation does matter. And yes. again, pulling so many books out. And it's almost like abortion, how abortion was used to be the main playing card every election. And now abortion is losing some of its steam because people are people are set in their minds. You're either going to be pro-life or you're going to be pro-choice. Right. And so now politically, there needs to be something else that can foster a conversation or something that may not even really have to be what, what is being presented as. And I believe CRT, critical race theory, has is, is the thing for the season, you know? It's the thing for the season. But when you really investigate it, you see right. critical race theory cannot be teaching your children in kindergarten because it's not, it's, it's not part of that curriculum. Right. Um, well, when yeah, it comes so. to school libraries, it's impossible uh, to say, hey, you're teaching my child uh, to be, you know, to be a part of the LBGTQ community, or you're, you're teaching my child to be a part of the Black Lives Movement, or you're teaching my child uh, to be a racist or to feel bad because um, I only teach 
uh, what as a teacher, the library teacher in me, I teach as an extension of the curriculum. So whatever the ELA math, science, social studies, or elective department is teaching, I teach on the extension of that. What's now, in our is ELA, is that English language arts? That's English language arts reading. Okay. So we actually, it's called ELAR at this point. But I just, you know, whatever they're teaching, I am an extension of that. I don't personally go to the shelves and say, oh, here's a book on Tango Makes Three, which is a book in elementary schools on um, homosexual penguins who make a family in the zoo. I wouldn't pull that book and say, let me build a lesson around Tango Makes Three and teach a lesson on a gay family. That would not be something I would do. Now, I can't speak for, you know, every librarian in the world, but that's not something that would be norm. You know, that would be something that maybe a radical person would do who felt the need to teach something on diversity. But if they did so want to teach a lesson on diversity, that wouldn't be so wrong because they're not teaching pro anything. They're just teaching diversity and how to uh, support that because you would not believe the lack of empathy a lot of our students have for people and groups that don't represent them. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and now, okay, so here's my pushback. Go ahead. Luang, hold your thought, hold your thought, bring it right back. Here's my pushback. I don't think children have empathy, period. I mean, just put the toys in front of them, even if they're not playing with the toys, if somebody else grabs it, then all of a sudden they're like, give me my toy. Because I believe they say around age 11 is where you move from concrete to abstract thought. So I don't really think kindergartners, third graders, I don't really think they 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 know how to be empathetic. And just hear my heart. I feel like it's a push to expect empathy from a first to a third grader. As someone who was in the first through third grade, I was not, I mean, People who naturally have a gift of mercy, you know, children who na naturally like, oh, look at the flowers, or hug all the puppies, that's part of their personality. But on well, average, I, I don't know too many second graders with empathy. It, everything well, has to be taught. Everything yeah. has to be taught. Right. So we teach our, we teach our, our children how to share, mm -hmm. uh, how to want to share. That is mm -hmm. part of empathy. We teach our children um, how to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I hurt you. That is part of empathy. Um, now, we is teach it, our children how to, well, Are they compliant yes. with those teachings because they're taught and they want to please, or are they compliant from a pure part of understanding? I, okay, I, I, go ahead, Wayne. Well, I, I think, you know, and, and I don't want to go too far down that road. I, I think it's a combination of both. I think it's taught at home and the environment, right? I thought it's a combination of both and the environment. You can you can have you can teach all the uh, the pleasantries at home, but then they they go into an environment that is anti what they taught. Uh, some of their natures is gonna conform, right? They're gonna conform just from for sheer survival. Uh, my thoughts. Um, when we were when we were speaking about uh, diversification of, of literature and education, uh, it it and speaking from a, a person of African descent, right, and understanding our our, our story. There was a time in our communities where reading was illegal. Reading was punishable by the harshest atrocities of the law in many yeah. states. Um, so this becomes a, a real important topic um, because we, we, we see uh, folks like Booker T. Washington, right, as an example, um, who in the midst, uh, one of the, the founding fathers of American sociology, right, he has to be given his credit. Um, and as the founder of American sociology and a civil rights activist, he presented multiple forms of, of, of unpopular history way back in the early 1900s, way back then, you know? Um, and to have a theory like critical race theory um, almost being, uh, being labeled anti-American, anti-literature, it just seems absurd as introducing William Shakespeare in the middle of the hood in Brooklyn, um, instead of you know introducing some some black 
um, notaries uh, like uh, Garlin Anderson. You know, so I think literature should be representat representation of all, you know, and this is why I love going to the libraries in Washington, D.C., right? When you go there, you see representation of almost every um, uh, citizen group in the country. Now, you have to go find some of the goods. So you got to go uh, dig and search, but you see it. Our library statewide should be a representation of that. Uh, just, just my two cents. Uh, we, we, we have to stop, you know, um, uh, infringement on uh, professions like yourself. Librarians should have the ability to know what, what's in their house, you know, uh, what's in the house and what's being disseminated based on their education, their upbringing, and the rules of that collective. Okay. All right. Kudos. Um, Question. The question is, do you think that exposing children to the to the diversity at that age can develop acceptance at all? Absolutely. I, I, I do. I do think that uh, starting young, exposing, you know, you just think of a child who, been, you know, that has been exposed to only people who look like them, act like them, believe like them their entire life until they are the age of 14. And then they go to a school where no one looks like them. Say they're put in a school where they're the minority or say they say, take a child who went to a school in maybe Oak Cliff and it was a predominantly African-American school. And then they are uprooted to the Las Colinas area where it's a high population of Indian and possibly a lot of Muslim students who have very different, um, their culture is very different where they pray six times a day. How do you think that child would react to that? They would be probably uncomfortable, don't you think? They yeah. never seen that before. I do. They okay, so here on the, cons I don't know if it's all conservative views, but here on the conservative and sometimes in the religious component, not just Christianity, but other religions as well. I can see how this statement where exposing children to the diversity at that age can de develop acceptance at all. I can see how that does get pushed back then from certain religious communities. Because if your, if your faith principles teach that homosexuality is wrong, then you wouldn't want your child to be around that or you know to be influenced by that at a young age before they can make an adult decision on whether that's something they want to go with or not which could also i mean that probably is why a lot of times when people who are raised in bubbles religious bubbles when they go to college they end up leaving the church real fast because they're around all the stuff that they've never been exposed to and they're like we got what it's not you know, they have all these other truths, quote, presented to them. And there's there's a great departure when people go to college and they were in Christian schools all the way up. But I do see where families, where Christian families would be like, eh, you know, again, I don't want my second grader. And there may be the exception to the rule that they're, they're exposed to homosexuality. But I can see where they would be like, no, I don't want my baby. I don't want my baby exposed to that. I can see where a Muslim family would be like, no. I don't want my baby just, exposed to that. Well, I just bring it. I'm sorry. No, please proceed. Well, bringing it back to a library perspective, mm -hmm. uh, we're not so much exposing. We're just putting the information there because we do have children who identify as gay at a very young age. Um, you know, whether whether they're gay or not, I, I you know, I'm not the person to say that. I, I don't identify and I don't diagnose children as gay. But whatever they feel they are, that's how they feel at that time. So if we have a seven or eight year old who is identifying as gay, we should have something for them to read about that community. Um, if there are a, if there's a child who has a friend who identifies as gay, they should have something to read about that because the, there are a lot of kids who cannot go home and say, uh, "Mom or Dad, I have a friend who says they're gay, 
can you tell me about that? Um, you know, I don't understand when they talk to me about this. Can, you know, please enlighten me because when they talk to me about them, you know, them being gay and how they feel about it, I don't know what to say. I can't help them, you know. So, so it's good to just have books. And trust me, when it's a book about those sensitive topics for younger kids, it's written where they can understand. It's not written to the point on a level that an adult would want to read. It's very childlike, it's very innocent, and it's very um, kid friendly. Um, the wording is not as graphic as we may think it is. Um, like even the book I, I, I stated earlier, Tango Makes Three. So they, you read between the lines that the family right. is gay. <laughs> so so uh, Leah, I, I remember, I, I'm a father of four children, okay? And I remember my, um, my son came home with a book from school about homosexuality, right? And to call me totally off guard, because in my home, we have yet to present this lesson uh, to him. Um, and I think all education has to start from home. I'm not gonna uh, allow a stranger of any sort, even if it's a familiar stranger. A familiar stranger is our teachers, preachers, policemen, mailmen, these are familiar strangers. You're familiar, but you're still a stranger um, to my home, to my culture. So when uh, he brought this book home, and it was it was using friendly f uh, phrases, right? Um, but we were so caught up guard because we have yet hit that lesson. There was no there was no um, there was no uh, prelude to the 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 the, the uh, lesson of the week. You know, normally if it's Black History Month or week, uh, we're teaching uh, about Black History or Native American History or Chinese appreciation Chinese American Appreciation Week. A letter comes home to say, hey, this is the syllabus for the week. So it, it gives us, here, here's some videos you can watch. But we had no warning and it caused an uproar in my entire community, you know, on uh, from some of my gay neighbors, my straight neighbors, black. It wasn't it wasn't a, a, a division uh, of sexuality or racial lines. Uh, so but this goes back to a whole different topic about having parental governance over your local schools. Right. Um, uh, which is a whole nother topic uh, that yields what type, what's being taught in your community um, to your children. Uh, so I just wanted to share that experience with you uh, as we explore. Uh, let's that, let's take a commercial break before we respond. Hold your response, Leah. Let's take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're gonna to respond to that because there, there has to be an approval process. And maybe we'll go into some of, some of who decides what is actually at accessible to students and at what level. So uh, let's take this quick break. We'll be right back. You guys know what to do, share the video. Thank you for your thoughts, Rebecca, Veronica, it's good to see you guys because this, you know, this is the future. This is the future. So uh, let's take this break. All right, and we're back. You're watching Knowledge and Nonsense. This is one of our community editions. And we're talking about the fact that librarians are under fire. Uh, lots of librarians are either being fired or losing their jobs because there are books in libraries and there's this whole fight over whether it's critical race theory or whether it's teaching people to be gay and just different things on one side. That's how it's presented. On another side, it's like representation matters. Look, we pay we pay taxes, we vote, we live here too. Like we are a melting pot. America is a melting pot. And then we get mad when the ingredients of the pot are actually like, hey, I'm in the pot. <laughs> you know, I'm in the pot too. And so before we left, Luane, you had said something about a book coming home and you guys were caught caught off guard because you hadn't initiated that conversation at home yet. And it brought into mind like the governance, I guess, locally in schools. And Leah, you had a response. 
Um, um, that actually comes up a lot, what you just said, LaWayne, about um, parents, um, students coming home with books that parents do not agree with. Uh, because, of course, the library is a separate entity from the classroom. The library does not have a curriculum. We are information providers. Um, now, our stand. Oh, say that again. Say what okay, again? No, go ahead. That, that just dropped on me. The library is not the classroom. It does not have a curriculum. I bet a lot of parents don't even really realize that. I never realized that. It is an information provider. It's what yeah, people we, go to get information. Okay, I'm sorry. This is they where we, go. we are a support to we, we are a support to the classrooms. We are support, we are a support, we we are called instructional supports. That's our role as a school librarian. Actually, my my official title is media specialist. Um, I'm an instructional support person for the building. So uh, my role is to support my instructional staff um, with uh, resources and information. My role to the students is to support them with information and technology. Uh, so the issue, and we have this issue with parents a lot, you know, mm -hmm. I am not comfortable with my child reading x y and z and you have the right to be you know to to um dictate what your child reads but you cannot dictate what other students read mm -hmm. um so what we say to that is you should contact your school's librarian and you know tell that person directly you know or send a note you know with your child that you know, they cannot read X, Y, Z, and we can put it, you know, notate that in their file. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hey, don't check out this these type of books to this student. But again, one parent should not have that authority to tell all 480 students in my school that they can't wow. read books on LBGT because one parent is not okay with that. We wow. have children that belong to that community, and right. I am not comfortable with taking that information away from them because of one or maybe 50 parents no, are not you. okay with it. Right. Wow. Mic drop. You know, that's, yeah. That's, that's, Mic drop. No. Leah. Hold on. Let's let that settle. That That's it. Mic drop. Because I am conservative, yeah. and I don't want, I wouldn't want my child, I don't want my nieces and nephews, I don't want them reading certain books at a certain age. And the way it comes across politically is the way it comes across politically. And I don't even know just politically. It also comes across in churches, from pulpits, from other religious uh, gatherings. It comes across like this is what they're teaching your kids as if it is a curriculum, first off. And so, th so that's some misinformation. That's the difference. Misinformation is wrong stuff that's passed. You know, the meme on social media that gets passed around and shared 50,000 times, but it's incorrect. Disinformation is when you do that intentionally, when you intentionally put falsehoods out there. So what I hear you saying is, if I don't want my child to read a book because we haven't had that conversation yet and he comes home with it, all I have to do is pick up the phone or contact my school librarian, wherever he brought that from and say, hey, Johnny, Johnny here, we don't want Johnny reading this. And that librarian is not going to overstep parental bounds. They're going to notate in the file. And it's solved. And that way, Johnny don't have to read it, but there's still representation for, for people who, who do identify, and that is them. So if you don't want your kid to read Ruby Briggs out of the library, you can call and say, hey, don't let my baby check out Ruby Briggs. We can't get mad about it because we have no. melanin. Don't let my baby check out Ruby Briggs, right? because it's not a curriculum. Now, if it's in the classroom, that's a different argument. But right now, they're trying to remove 850 books. And it's almost like a... It's a witch. It's no, a white walk of history again, if you're not, if you're not aware. Listen, if I may, um, history has been whitewashed. And I'm putting, up, I'm putting up a period. I'm going to be honest. It has been. My um, I, um, 
look, what on the news right now is everything about Ukraine and the Cold War, right? And I'm 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 referencing this for a purpose. Um, one of the uh, uh, one of the most insidious byproducts of the Cold War was in, institutionalized secrecy in society. That was the that was the worst byproduct from that era of history because we had whole continents only taught uh, one theory, right? Only looking at one source of media, only understanding uh, that greatness only looks like this uh, scripted viewpoint. Um, and I, I always get concerned uh, to, to think on the, on a larger scale, what we are teaching our children, not just your child, but what are we teaching our children? How are we really preparing them to enter a world of, of, of globalization? Um, are we uh, institutionalizing them to a degree that their their, their only strengths are going to be in their zip code or in their, their local you know surroundings? Um, so I, I agree with a broad span of learning. I totally agree with that because it has to happen. Um, uh, I don't agree with anyone trying to put the device grips on our librarians to dictate uh, how to do their job. You're in that role for a reason. So I think that's a slippery slope. Um, uh, you don't want your child being taught certain you know, lessons and you want to stick it strict to religion. I recommend you find a religious institution that can meet your needs. They have both public and private that will give you everything you need, full control. Uh, but for our public school systems, it has to represent uh, 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 globalization. It has to represent uh, a higher uh, arcing goal. Um, and Leah, as an example, Barack Obama, it, it pees me to say first black president. You know, take away black secularization and let's 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 judge these people, even our new Supreme Court nominee, on the morals. Let that speak for itself. And I think the same should be with the lessons being taught or the books distributed. Well, um, when we speak of representation, so my school makeup is 51% Hispanic, 49% African, African American. Hmm. Um, I've been a school librarian for 12 years. This is my first year on this campus where I am today. Um, when I so the, the you know, was fully stocked when I got there. But the first thing I did was walk through and look, you know, I need to look around and see what the collection looked like. You know, full transparency. I wasn't okay with some of the books in there. I'm a Christian. So when I see books on, you know, when I see an overwhelming amount of books on LBGTQ, that does make me uncomfortable. I don't know why we need to have so many LBGTQ books. It, it, it makes me question who was the person who ordered all these books and what was their agenda? Mm. Um, That's but, point. Yes. Because sometimes uh, you can go into a library and look through the collection, and sometimes their uh, their their personality shines through. The librarians. That's a mic job for me. The librarians, <laughs> right? Or agenda can mm -hmm. shine through in the mm -hmm. collection, and we have to be very careful of that because my first instinct was to start pulling some of those off the shelf. But I stopped myself because it. I had to take my personal feelings out of it and put the, you know, this is about information. This is not about you. Because when I'm purchasing books or building a collection, I tend to want to buy things that I like. Oh, I like this. I like this. I like this. Author. But again, it's not about me. I'm not building my personal library. Um. Yeah. Because And I also have to wonder when I walk through and I see books that were just full of blue eyed, blonde eyed, you know, blue eyes, blonde hair people. Who bought these books? Because it surely could not have been a person of color. Or what it was, but that was their only option. That They have limited options. No, today, the last 10, I must say the last 10 years, mm -hmm. Uh, multicultural books have been in abundance. There is no problem finding multicultural books and multicultural cultural authors. They're mm -hmm. out there. 
and we can find them. We can get to them. They're readily available. We just have to buy them there. Um, but that person didn't buy them. Okay. Because they didn't find it important. Mm -hmm. And I see that in a lot of libraries. The, my last library, um, when I first got there, that collection looked that way as well. Leah, and can I ask you who, who authorizes what books? Because a oh, uh, moment, moment of transparency, uh, truth. You're the first librarian I've ever met in person or virtually at all. So thanks for, <laughs> thanks for that, this experience. Um, but who authorizes what books go goes into a library who's that power broker okay so the um the way book uh development goes uh collection development excuse me is first every school district the board sets the actual guidelines on purchasing you know this this is these are the, the set guidelines okay we have a set guideline and within those guidelines the school librarian picks the collection. I have the autonomy to pick whatever books I want that are within the guideline. Now, it is everyone's responsibility to ensure that the books are age level appropriate for your, you know, if you're elementary, your books need to reflect elementary school. If you're middle, they need to reflect middle school. I don't go out buying a lot of YA books because that's too old for my students. In high school, they have uh, more leeway because they can go young and they can go high. They can go all the way up to young adult. Um, I only venture in young adult if it's like a really popular series like um, Twilight. That was young adult, very popular. Uh, you would not get a library, middle school library without students begging for that book. Mm -hmm. um, so I only venture over to YA, but of course we have to read reviews. Um, your book reviews are what you primarily need to go off of. You need to read top reviews, ALA reviews, um, publisher reviews. You have to read at least like two, three reviews and reviews also tell you the interest, the uh, age interest and the level. This book is good for grades, blah, blah, blah. And that will kind of, so if anyone questions, because books can be challenged, um, anyone, any stakeholder can come and challenge a book. There's a formal process, but a book can be challenged and you need to be able to back up. How, why do you have this book in your library? Mm -hmm. And why is it appropriate? So you need to have done your due diligence when you purchase that book. Um, as well as um, looking at sources like Common Sense Media, they will tell you um, what books are appropriate for which age groups, not only books, but what movies. So before I show a film, it needs to go, I need to look at Common Sense Media and it needs to tell me if this is appropriate for my age group. Wow. Did, did so that, that, that is the guidelines. Okay. You know what? What what? I may be hearing this wrong, but I hope I'm not. But what breaks my heart is this, this is how, like, what we say, not marginalized, well, marginalized communities, but also like underfunded communities or where there are language barrier communities, like a lot of these resources parents may not know about and the books that are being funneled into those places if you have a librarian that is not diligent and that is not passionate about what they're doing or, you know, being a being a gatekeeper, not to keep things out, but also allow the right things in, then, oh my gosh, you know, like you have parents who are always at work, like no one has, I'm just thinking about where there's not a parental voice or the parental voice is otherwise engaged that there's no say so you have no say so hmm. over 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 things in your own local school which takes us back to politics and yes. being involved and showing up at PTA yeah. meetings and voting it's, it's, it's a, it's I a, hate yeah. that for librarians though you guys are kind of in the middle it's um yeah everything's political now everything eventually uh we probably won't even have Every a public <laughs> listen public schools are under threat whether you know it or not that's my opinion this is my opinion Hmm. This is a sharing opinion. 
public schools are under threat. So, the Wayne, you said something earlier. There are other entities. Well, so you probably have to have private school schools. School librarians are definitely. And, and you know what, Leah? Yeah, librarians are under threat. Are definitely under threat. But we don't hear about this in mainstream media. This is this is what this is what also is troubling. There's so many layers of of what's what's out there, right? We shouldn't have to search to find out what's going on with our school librarians. They should be on top of the charter, on top of the uh, AP news row, right? So this again goes back to that that narrative. You know, there's so many levels and sub levels of, of certain agendas. You know, and this is not conspiracy talk. This, this is this is what's right in front of you without you knowing is even in front of you. You know, um, the, so, truth, the, mm -hmm. the truth is, is that um, when you look at the structure of the uh, school system and all the different positions, I would have to say school librarians in most uh, on most campuses are the um, the most overlooked positions um, because many people, and when you ask, like many people don't know that school librarians, you have to be one, you have to get a graduate degree just to be a, a librarian. And that's not just in public schools, but that's in um, city libraries. Every librarian wow. has, has a graduate degree. That's, that's mandatory. Really? Um, Masters are above? Yes. That's 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 the minimum to become a librarian. Librarian. Hey. That that's you have to I have, never knew that. It, yes, you have to have a there's a degree is masters of library science. Mm. That's that's the minimum. Now school librarian, you can loophole it and get a certification in school librarian, but you still have to have a some type of master's degree. I have two. I have two master's degrees. Um so you just no, you just can't, you know, just go and say, hey, I want to be a librarian. You have to go through an entire program. I had to take wow. 24 hours in Masters of Library Science on top of already having a graduate degree to get that certification. Um, it, it's, it's major because it's a serious thing because people think, oh, all librarians do is check books in and check books out. No. If you look at our job description, that's not even on there. Circulating books. Wow. Yeah. Listen, oh. listen. We uh Leah, we, we we should we should uh I would certainly like to see your campaign when you jump into the political reign. You know, we got the smartest people uh distributing books and, and managing those catalogs. We need these brilliant minds in politics. Because if it starts in it starts in politics, right? So uh, immediately after this, I want to uh, just so you know what I'm going to do some my Saturday. I want to know how many librarians have converted to the political arena, because um, uh, that that's what you want, right? You want brilliance running the ship, not not just uh, charisma. So this, I only this, know uh, one, and that was Laura Bush. Hmm. That was who Bush? She was Laura Bush. She was a school librarian. Hmm. Wow. Wow, wow the, uh, first lady. Yes. Wow. wow. See, knowledge and nonsense. There you hey, go. I just, you know, this is the thing with knowledge and nonsense. This has been a great conversation. I've learned a lot. Uh, Leah, thank you so much. Community mm -hmm. edition. I have learned. I've learned a lot because I. I'm just going to do a quick recap because it's already like 9:50 where I am, so 10:50 on the East Coast. This time actually does go by, so. We definitely debunk the the political usage of CRT as a threat to the, our young people because it's a curriculum that is not even before something is post secondary. Um, representation does matter, and we've debunked that the fact that these books are teaching certain things to children because it's not a curriculum. The classroom and the library they're separate. Now, the library supports the classroom, but if there's a book or something that your child brings home that you don't want them to bring home, you can simply call your librarian and say, hey, little Timmy, little Johnny, little Angelique, uh, Dejan Sine, whatever, whoever it is, um, uh, Sadiq, whoever it is, 
hey, I don't want my child reading this book. My child is not allowed to check this book out, so to speak. And then the notations are made. So when the child comes up there, it's like, no, you can't check this one. Now you have to go get another book. It's like, it's a simple debunk in there that librarians have to have a master's degree or more, you know? So they're not just, they're not just people who were shuffled over there. This is an actual science. And you also said not to put your personality over the goods of those who are using the library. Right. So I have to pull myself out of that, you know? My yeah. personality is not to be reflected in this library. It's to represent the people who are using the library. I mean, there's just so much stuff I learned just today. Like what? You know, you know what I just looked up? Oh, go ahead, Leah, please. Go ahead, Leah. I just want to add one thing. We also need more people of color joining the profession. Um, in my last at school district, and let me just add, I have worked for both two of the largest school districts in the DFW area. And the last school district, there were only about 11 of us, <laughs> 11 African-American uh, librarians. I remember my first meeting, um, some of the clerks asked me to come sit with them. And when I told them, you know, they were like, what school do you work at? And I told them and they was like, Oh, I didn't know it was a clerk over there. And I said, no, I'm the librarian. They were shocked. Mm. Wait, they were shocked. Wait. <laughs> so is that like somebody going, to, <laughs> is that like the CEO going to a meeting? I'm not saying you're the CEO, but is that like a CEO going to the meeting and somebody yeah. sitting at the table asked him to get him something to drink because they assume because they're a female Absolutely. or because they are a minority that they're not that? Right. Wow, because okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. So you said, no, I'm the librarian. In the field, there's not, when I go to our uh, Texas Librarian Association conventions, we're far few and in between. Mm -hmm. So if there are more representation in the field, then we would probably see more representation in the collections. Hmm. Hey, you know, Mike, you know what I just read? Uh, oh Carla Hayden was sworn in as the 14th Librarian of Congress on September 14, 2016. Hayden, the first woman and first African-American to lead the National Library, was nominated uh, to the position by President Barack Obama on February 24, 2016. Never heard of her, never heard of that position. Uh, and this is impactful. So team folks looking in, uh, viewers, Google Carla Hayden. Uh, they know that uh, we know I know about the Library of Congress and it should have been a no brainer. If there's a Library of Congress, it must be a Librarian of Congress as well. So this is. It has, yeah. Yes, we have a major. Our, our association is large. You know, there's Texas Library Association and there's the American Library Association. We're large. Uh, we're a large conglomerate. Um, but you only look into what you care about. Mm. Right. So if you, you got to care about us. And I just want to shout out one of uh, one librarian from Tulsa, Oklahoma. She was a woman of color, Dr. Joanne Patton. She was the first um, librarian I met. I used to, she was my colleague in my last school district who had a doctorate degree. Amazing wow. woman. Wow. See? This is why representation does matter though. You saw somebody who's your colleague, African-American, representation matters. People tease me, but I, I put it on LinkedIn. If I can see me, then I can be me. And then you have some people like, oh, you can't see yourself? Yeah, okay, you're the person asking the, the justice to define a woman. No, if I can see me, then I can be me. There's representation matters. It matters. And subliminally, when there is no representation, you are telling somebody that the person not represented, that you can't be this, that that's not for you, that you need to look elsewhere. And so representation does matter. Please be involved. Lee, if there was anything you could share or you would want the public to know, A, uh, please look at that list of 850 books that's on the chopping block and hold your politicians accountable for trying to sneak this stuff onto separate bills. But if there's anything you would want the public to know, Leah, what would it be and, and what could the public do to make sure that, you know, the library remains an access point for all people? Oh, okay, yeah. absolutely. I'll contact Jerry Cross, I'm sorry, Matt Cross. He represents the district in Fort Worth. 
He is on uh, the Texas Republican. He's a Texas Republican state uh, representative. He has created this uh, horrible list. And I'm I'm personally offended at a lot of the books that's on here, but I'm just going to throw out a couple. There is an African-American author by the name of Jerry Craft. He has two nationally award-winning books, New Kid and Class Act. He personally did a um a podcast with the entire school district um on our National Read Aloud Day. His books, I can't keep his books on my shelf because they are they are so attractive to my African American boys. They want them gone. Actually, they were temporarily removed from the libraries in Katy, Texas. Um, their school, their entire school district removed his book. Um, they're on the 850 list. Uh, a book, King Sierra. That was a big, uh, my um, Hispanic girls, I couldn't keep that on the shelf. They want that book removed. Why are you removing a book about a important holiday for young Hispanic, young, uh, young Hispanic girls? I, I don't understand that. That's swiping their culture out. Uh, the Indian Removal Act and Trail of Tears. Why would you want that book taken out of libraries? That's history. That's atrocious. I'm personally offended because that is part of my history. <laughs> that is, um, then you have an African American and Latina X history of the United States. We don't want those two groups to know about their history in the United States. That's offensive. And lastly, yeah. there's a book called Queer, There and Everywhere, 23 People Who Changed the World. Why would we not want our LBGTQ children to see people that look like them, who are like them, excuse me, who are like them as heroes? I don't know why we wouldn't. And yeah. I don't know why those books pose a threat at all. I, they don't pose a threat, but um, actually, yeah. they're, they're using keywords. 59.95% of the books that are on that list are about, they have something to do with LBGTQ plus community. 59.95% of those books, they want them gone. Uh, race and racism, 8.5%. Oh, one percent. Now, mind you, these are supposed to be books that make people uncomfortable. And it, the CRT, anti-CRT bill, 39.79 was supposed to be about race. But yet we have 59.95 percent of these books about one Sexuality community. and gender. Yeah. And sex education books made up 13.55 percent. Then, of course, there is books about pregnancy, abortion. Mm -hmm. Anything uh, regarding Roe versus Wade is on that list. Uh, wipe that whole history out, of course. Um, and even anything regarding um, teen laws, their rights. And it's not just about reproductive rights or anything like that, just their rights in general. They don't need to Emancipation walk the even. Wow. So this list, is this list, so this list is just books that are like, we're going to take these all out of the education system, all out of libraries? He... Uh, uh, he came up with this list, I'm pretty sure, using keywords, race, uh, the LBGTQ, um, sex, and uh, he probably put in specific races, Hispanic, Black. And he came up with this list of craziness, and he sent it to the Texas Education Agency that governs every school in Texas and told them to uh, contact every school to see if they, these books are in the, um, in the libraries and how much money was spent on these books. And now everyone is expected to, you know, answer to this. And of course, the next thing is gonna, you know, now they're starting book bands. Wow. Hmm. Wow, that's crazy. Uh, and of course, you know, the saddest part of this is this is this stuff is just part of an election game, you know? It's fear-mongering and it's an election game. You heard it here clearly. This is why this is knowledge and nonsense, guys. Some things are nonsense. There is knowledge. You there's a process. If you don't want your child reading something, call the librarian. Point blank. If there's a book that you don't approve of and you don't want your child reading it, then just call the librarian. 
it's your child. Talk to your child about it. And don't hold somebody who's not in your household accountable for 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 the upbringing of your child. They're there to support right. education and have things accessible. If I go to a library looking for a book about a topic I'm interested in, I want to be able to find it. And I don't want it to know that someone is banded because they want to be elected or because they need to stir up fear and division and right. animosity against the other ingredients in my melting pot. We in this thing together. But so it, also, it, it, it just also uh, uh, reminds me of what I, I guess shared earlier. She gave the percentage uh, uh, of ethnicities in her school, right? So based on those percentages, if those parents or guardians will come out and vote and, and those numbers represented, uh, the communities in which a library sits can truly have a voice because there's no way this that sort of a atrocity would, would go down in other communities. Again, there's no way any representative, any congressman would touch a uh, 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 um, Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, New York, where I'm from. You know, the largest Hasidic Jewish community in the world outside of Israel. Those books and those libraries are determined by the community in which they sit, right? And if anyone uh, outside of that, um, uh, who's, who outside of that, um, that ecosystem is trying to create a, a narrative adverse to community in which it represents, it would be a firestorm. And, and it should be a firestorm. Uh, so please let us know how we can get involved. You know, um, we, we have to promote knowledge. We have to eliminate or reduce nonsense. And uh, it was a pleasure meeting you on today's uh, uh, platform. It truly was. Well, thank you for having me. One of the things, when I went to university at Oral Roberts, one of the things that was an economics teacher there, and he always used to just hit his hand on the, on the table. And he said, we must stamp out ignorance. And he would be so passionate about it. And uh, to me, this conversation is, is an extension of him saying we must stamp out ignorance. So guys, be involved. Don't let this just be a water cooler conversation, but be involved. If you're in the Texas area, please, uh, we put the information up there for Representative Krauss. Just, you know, you can't just, let's not ban books. Let's not ban books. Let's let parents know what their options are and that they do have say-so. Let's reinforce the say-so that they have. It's set up for them to have certain say-sos. No one's, no one's stripping away your parental rights. Um, Y'all be safe and God bless. Again, uh, in the comments, you'll be able to see that address if you want to reach out. Uh, it would be helpful. Liv, thank you so much. Thanks I wish you nothing but support. Um, I'm excited to hear and see more about the the collection that you present for for your for your people so that they can have access and representation does matter and if we are you're still out there hollering crt on a humbug please figure out what crt is so that you're not out there just saying something without an intellectual basis without a leg to stand on quit letting I, people play you as their puppet mm -hmm. I, I, I i i would love to know What's your, because I have a mandatory read book, right? I have 50 books that I think you must read. I would love to get your list. What what books made your mandatory read book? Um, the and, librarian. Oh, okay. The per, I'm sorry, the personal librarian. The personal librarian is about an African-American woman who um, who passed. She, she passed as white. So that she could get a job um, and work as a librarian. And she was, <laughs> and of course, this was, you know, a long time ago, but um, it's a really good read. It's a really good read. And she did what she had to do, but, you know, to get her job, but she was really good at it and she made some changes. Hmm. Because representation matters. So everybody Google the personal librarian, read it. If you're not a big reader, get it on Audible. Uh, and if you can't do that, then find somebody who will read it and sit down and let them tell you about it. Mm. Oh, April is school librarian month. So support your, support your local school library in some kind of way. If you just want to go and ask if you can read a story or um, to a group of students, that would be much welcomed. Um, they would be shocked that you even knew it was school library month. We know. They would love it. And um, 
And we also, my school will be celebrating um, Di Book Diversity Day on April the 29th. Okay. Oh, I didn't, I didn't put uh, the diversity day, but I'm going to put it on there. I did put the librarian well, day. Actually, the actual book diversity day is April the 30th, but that's a Saturday. So most schools will be doing something to celebrate it on April the 29th. All right. Excellent. This has been such an informative conversation yeah. here on Knowledge and Nonsense Community Edition, because again, although we work in medical facilities, we work in healthcare, nobody lives where they work and these other things have to do with your day-to-day -day life this has to do with your children this has to do with representation all of us don't look alike all of us are not the same gender all of us are not the same socioeconomic class all of us are not the same faith-based you know and so representation matters we're a melting pot quit trying to cook a soup with one ingredient we are a melting pot and let's not whitewash anything. Let's look at it for what it is so we can make better, more informed decisions moving forward. Uh, this has been Sharon Combs, Luane Perkins, Leah Birmingham out of Fort Worth. Thank you so much on knowledge. Yeah, and knowledge. Of course, Leah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, you killed the game today and you dropped some real knowledge, some things that we can use. And so guys, share this video if you have any questions or comments. You know, just send them in. Even though this episode is over, send them in. We will still get the responses to you. And yeah, have a great weekend. Yeah, indeed. Thank, Thank you. you.